Ben, and thank you all for coming back after our annual meeting. And we are here, glad to present you with this panel. Uh, our panelists are uh, Andy Hunter, who is the founder and CEO of bookshop.org. He's also the co-founder and publisher of Catapult Press, the co-creator and publisher of the website's literary hub, Crime Reads and Bookmarks, and co-founder and chairman of Electric Literature. His focus is helping books remain a vital part of our culture in the digital age. We are also joined by Michael Cater, who created and runs Publishers Lunch and publisher, PublishersMarketplace.com. Prior to that, he created and produced over 300 books through his book packaging company, Cater Books. Aisha Pandey has worked in the publishing industry for over 20 years. Before launching her boutique agency, she was a senior editor at Farrow Strauss and Giroux and held editorial positions at HarperCollins and Crown Publishers. Aisha is a member of the AALA, which is Association of American Literary Agents member of Penn, the Asian American Writers Workshop, and the Women's Media Group. She holds a master's degree from Columbia University. Uh, Omer Kazi is our Authors Guild Director of Policy and Advocacy. He studied law at the University of Iowa and created writing at Columbia University. I myself am Cheryl Davis, the General Counsel of the Authors Guild, and I am very pleased to introduce our moderator for this evening, Jane Friedman, who is the editor of The Hot Sheet, a publishing industry newsletter for professional authors, which was named 2020 Media Outlet of the Year by Digital Book World. Her latest book is The Business of Being a Writer, which is published by the University of Chicago Press. Take it away, Jane. Thank you so much, Cheryl, and welcome everyone tonight. I'm gonna start uh, with just a broad overview of trends in 2020. And I think most of us know that it was a really wonderful year for book sales. Uh, book sales were up by more than 8% on the print side. There were gains in audio and eBooks, but there are a lot of other things that are going underneath the surface. There are certain things that are driving that growth and that are probably gonna affect sales into 2021 and beyond. So um, Michael, you've written about these uh, factors in Publishers Lunch, and I'm hoping that you might expand on what happened in 2020 and why, and how that's going to affect things going forward. Sure, well, as you said, we, we know the sales were good. We know that they were up in, in, at a level that we rarely see in this industry, which has long been considered a, a low growth industry, uh, which is terrific. We actually don't know exactly how much those sales gain. You, you cited the 8.2% figure, which is, which is the NPD book scan figure, um, and they, they monitor sales of print units, so actual you know, numbers of books sold at what they estimate is roughly 85% of the market. Um, the other number that we have is even better, which the AAP, the Association of American Publishers, which gets revenue reporting from the largest publishers and, and most of the distributed smaller and independent publishers actually showed figures going up 10.2% when you measure dollars, not units. Um, so the, those are both good numbers, but they're telling us different things, which is part of the trick in, in being definitive about exactly what happened, right? The, those AAP numbers, actually the largest increase wasn't more sales, it was fewer returns. So a much cleaner sale, um, fewer books sitting around in bookstores that then got shipped back to publishers because they didn't sell. Uh, but what that also is telling us is the big trend that Andy can certainly speak to and others is online sales grew in a huge way. Online sales have been growing consistently for years. My dog is agreeing with me, um, but online sales particularly jumped last year. Cooper, please, not, not now, buddy. Sorry. <laughs> um, so that was definitely a factor of the growth. Publishers shipped about the same dollar volume that they usually do. That was actually kind of flat because bookstores were closed and not necessarily ordering the same way, but customers still wanted books, right? So they were, they were getting them more directly. Um, the other element in the, in the AP numbers was digital growth primarily. Uh, digital audio grew again as it has been growing for years now, but eBooks grew for the first time in many years. Once again, easy to see a pandemic correlation there, right? Um, in the AP data, it was actually adult sales that led the way. So the, the, biggest, the biggest dollar gains came from adult books in, in the actual money that consumers paid out. Um, but conversely, in the book scan universe, which is measuring 
the, the, the units of books sold, it was children's books that saw the biggest gains. Um, and there that sort of makes sense, right? Because children's books usually cost less. So, so bigger children's units might not show the same dollar gains. Um, and in the book scan universe, they're capturing some educational publishers and some other types of independent publishers who obviously thrive by selling children's activity books and children's educational books um, and other things that we might not even consider trade books or we might not consider as coming from trade publishers. But because we have these two different ways of measuring our business and either one is definitive, they're telling us different things about what increased, right? Um, so, so we know it was a good year. Uh, we also know it was a bad year for some people, right? If you published travel books, um, if you published or authored illustrated books, the kinds of things that you have to see and feel and touch in a physical sp physical store, things weren't so good. So, you know, part of part of what we try to help people focus on is there was there was a lot to celebrate, and we all are always very excited when our business is doing well because we all believe in the book and we believe in reading more than any particular book or any particular type of reading. Um, but there was a lot of pain, it was spread around. Um, and some of that pain accrued to authors as well, right? Because what's good for the industry and what's good for the companies in the industry doesn't necessarily flow down to authors. Um, and there, one of the trends that we saw was backlist previously published books, books more than a year old, sold better than ever. Um, that has been the trend for years, but sort of crossed a new high watermark. So all of those gains that we're hearing about from BookScan came from Backlist and more. Um, so if you were the author of a new book last year, the odds are maybe it wasn't a great year for you and you're feeling badly that everybody's talking about how wonderful business was, but you struggled to get attention for your book and to get sales for your book. And there the numbers back us up, right? Fiction in particular, Nonfiction books have been increasing year over year. It all comes back to the online effect, right? There are more nonfiction books, long tail drive sales, online drive sales. So lots of, so the sales are piling up over hundreds of thousands of different discrete titles, many of the nonfiction. But new adult fiction sales were down 4 million units. New children's fiction sales were down 5 million units. Um, so there too, the statistics are telling us things are spread unevenly. Um, Aisha is going to talk more in a minute about some of the other challenges that authors, particularly authors of, of new books, faced last year that might continue on. Um, so I don't want to step on her toes there. I'll just add one other interesting uh, statistical tidbit, which is another thing that fell was subright sales, right? So sales to publishers around the world, um, both because pandemic interrupted their business, but also because pandemic interrupted book fairs and the ways that people sell things. Just a publisher's marketplace where we log lots of deal reports, we saw that our international deal reports were down by about 8%. Um, often that's a very important income source for authors, right? Because particularly if their agent is making the sale outside of the basket of publishing rights that was sold to the primary publisher, authors expect to see that money flow through to them pretty quickly. Um, so that can have an impact. Looking forward for this year, we don't know yet, right? Because we still don't know where we stand with vaccinations and pandemic. The, 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 the unfortunate suspicion of people doing forecasting is that return to normal may mean a, a, a diminishment of some of this uptick that we've seen in the book business. Um, it may also mean a rebalancing of some of which types of books sell, right? If people are traveling again, that sector could be rejuvenated. If physical bookstores are open again and people can see and feel and touch the types of authors they're gonna be exposed to, the types of word of mouth recommendation they're gonna get, the types of books they can hold in their hands again are gonna change. Um, I think the hope is that this big uptick from pandemic uh, both cemented the relationship that core readers and buyers have to books as being primary in their lives in, in times of need and not, and may have also brought in some other people, some of the occasional customers, some of the ones who came for educational materials, but saw what a boon that was, saw what that did for their kids, have gotten their kids hooked on a new series or a new outlet and have been awakened to books so that the hope is that we can carry over some of that growth and build on it. Excellent, thank you so much. Michael, so you, you almost set up a great segue for me into 
Aisha to talk about anything that that you're seeing with new authors getting launched in 2020, or um, it doesn't even really have to be no new authors, any new title launches in 2020 and how you saw that play out. Thank you so much, Jane. Um, and, and thanks, Michael, for that overview. That was uh, very, very informative. Um, obviously, you know, my uh, contribution to this conversation is going to be a little bit more anecdotal. Um, and I had clients that experienced the very worst of 2020 and also, you know, uh, the very best of 2020. Um, I had two clients, neither one of them were debut authors, you know, who had books coming out in March. And, you know, those, th that was truly a very unfortunate and difficult scenario, um, both with from major publishing houses and neither publishing house at that particular point had managed to pivot and figure out, you know, how to do the work from remote locations and, and particularly how to effectively uh, publicize and promote those books. And they just tanked and there was nothing to be done. And of course, you know, the, the long tail of the hardcover tanking means that, you know, the paperback pretty much has very little opportunity as well um, because the, the, the large chains, um, you know, uh, make their, their orders for the paperback dependent on the, you know, the sales of the hardcover and there were, there were no sales. Um, so it was, it was very unfortunate. Um, but then amidst all the uh, toxicity and difficulty of 2020, there were also a few highlights. And that was of course, um, writers of color and writers particularly writing into the anti-racist space. And, you know, I did, um, I do represent a few in writers in that particular vein. And of course they saw their book uh, go to the top of the bestseller list and stay there for lengthy periods of time as readers were truly engaging um, with um, those conversations, you know, uh, more than they ever had before. So one of my clients is Ibram X. Kendi and his book, um, How to Be an Anti-Racist had briefly hit the bestseller list that previous August. And then after the, the BLM protests, it went back to the bestseller list and stayed there for an ex extensive period of time. In fact, it's still there. Um, I also represent um, Tiffany Jewell, who wrote a children's book. Um, this book is anti-racist and it's, it's had a similar trajectory. So um, those were, you know, the experiences in 2020. But uh, what has been very heartening is the way that um, publishers have now pivoted uh, to the virtual space and are creating very effective um, book events and uh, marketing plans. Um, and that can be seen by my, my client, uh, Patricia Engel, whose new book, Infinite Country, came out in this March and um, has, you know, was, it, the publisher did an absolutely brilliant job. Um, and I, I, I couldn't be more pleased with the ways in which they are now uh, taking full advantage of all of the tools that are available to them. And in fact, of course, you know, instead of, Patricia going to read at bookstores and, you know, on a good day, uh, attracting 50 to 60, re, uh, you know, members of an audience. Now hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people can come. And it's been, it's really been a boon for, um, for authors, you know, to attract nationwide audiences. So um, the other thing that I've seen, of course, is that um, the publishers are, after an initial sort of state of paralysis are uh, very aggressively acquiring um, across, you know, multiple different genres. Um, specifically though, still what I can tell in the space of, you know, practical, how do we deal with the pandemic kind of thing, gardening and crafts and things like that. Also, you know, they still are actively looking to diversify their lists and not only, you know, anti-racist authors, but just general writers from other cultures and from other marginalized backgrounds. Um, and um, I guess the, the final trend that I want to talk about is the very 
long drawn out print schedules as there has been a sort of backlog of you know of printing and um ships sort of being held in the harbor and stuff like that so that that books have to go to the printer far far earlier than they ever had um so you know things are taking much much longer to get published than they ever have before Aisha, I've heard some agents say, and I won't name names, that they found themselves avoiding more challenging work right now because they felt like they either didn't have the attention span for it themselves because of all of the anxiety surrounding the pandemic and or they were worried the editors they were submitting to just didn't have the mind space for it. Have you found that to be true or is that just going to differ too much on an agent by agent basis? I particularly have not found that to be true, um, but I have heard um, colleagues, agent colleagues say that, you know, that that editors are asking them for um, light escapist fare. And um, one of the things that I have heard lately, um, which I find a little bit worrying, you know, in terms of the kinds of clients that I represent is that um, there's now, you know, sort of a, slight waning of interest in stories that um, that explore trauma and and particularly racial trauma and that you know i'm getting more feedback that um, they're looking for other types of stories stories of joy story of success stories of happiness and love and 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 things like that and um you know while obviously i I, I do understand this. There should be a broad range of stories. Um, there, it's hardly that we've had a, you know a lot of um, the the stories that explore racial trauma. You know, after just a few months of having those kinds of books acquired. Jane, just just one data point to throw against that, since since we are operating on individual perspectives and reports when we talk to ag agents. So, Publishers Marketplace, we also we also chart domestic deals. Uh, our biggest deal reporting stream is domestic. And, and interestingly, last year we saw our total deal reports go up. Uh, again, they declined somewhat in March, but the rest of the year was up, up almost 8%. But as to the type of books, we saw adult fiction up almost 15% in terms of total deal reports. Now, I can't tell you the nature and character of those stories and maybe some people would say fiction in and of itself can be escapist, um, but the fiction market had been lackluster for at least a few years there. And, and we certainly saw publishers investing in fiction again, even though, as we were saying, nonfiction has been driving a lot of sales. So, so it signals a belief that, that there's still a restorative or inspiring power to fiction and that, that fiction is still something that publishers are looking for in case people thought that maybe publishers had sort of given up on that and decided that nonfiction was just a safer, steadier market. That is reassuring. And, and maybe to add to that, I saw a report for the UK market, this was earlier in the year from the bookseller where they measured sales of debut fiction in 2020 versus 2019. And there was about a 10 to 15% increase in sales. Um, so despite, you know, the, the bookstores being closed, um, maybe things weren't as bright and rosy in the United States, but the UK saw really nice uptake of new fiction. Um, also, the number of titles uh, going out was reduced. Um, so that kind of made it a little more remarkable, even maybe there was more time to focus on a smaller number of titles. I don't know. Okay, well, switching gears, I want to move over to Andy. And Michael mentioned in his overview that there's been a switch or you know, more online sales, which makes a lot of sense. And you had the good fortune to launch Bookshop in January. So uh, I wanted to give you an opportunity to talk both about what I think you've called the white knuckled ride of launching Bookshop during a pandemic, um, and also what you're hearing and seeing from bookstores uh, right now. Yeah. Yeah, it was definitely an insane experience launching Bookshop. Uh, we had thought that it was an incredible urgency because Amazon was growing so fast and taking on so much market share. And then six weeks into what we thought was going to be a relatively quiet beta period, we suddenly had 
um, hundreds of stores onboarding and our sales grew maybe 4,000%. Um, and we were fighting to keep it all together. At the same time, the schools shut down. My kids were at home. They were working on devices. We never let them use an iPad before. And suddenly they had to be on an iPad all day. My landlord decided to start um, digging out the basement. So to start a basement apartment. So it was a jackhammer underneath me all day. And I was trying to um, keep the system up and keep the order shipping, et cetera. Um, so it was, it was really wild, but at the time, it was extremely gratifying that we were getting so many emails and so much feedback from the stores that we were able to help. Um, many, many stores had not jumped on the e-commerce bandwagon and the ABA, which had been valiantly building sites for stores through their indie commerce platform was overwhelmed by the sudden need for stores to um, create their own websites. And on Bookshop, you can create a website for, and start selling books to your customer in half an hour or less. So, and there's no upfront costs and no technical knowledge necessary. And you don't even have to go into your store and um, pick, pack a book and bring it to the post office because it's all goes is fulfilled through Ingram. So we were sort of the perfect pandemic solution. And that's why we boomed so much. And, um, and we were really happy to be there at that moment for those stores. Um, we definitely saw a ton of socially active um, book buyers, like book buyers that cared about, cared enough to not shop at Amazon are the same book buyers that cared a lot about like the Black Lives Matter movement. And speaking of how to be an anti-racist, that was our most popular book last year. Um, and it was great to be on top of that too. It was great to be part of what was fueling um, a lot of those books that were extremely important for people to read um, at that time. Now we're coming out of that. We earned about $12 million for bookstores in our first year off of about $50 million in book sales. And we want to do a lot more this year um, but it's, it's not a total success story because there's the problem that we're trying to solve is so big. Um, most bookstores sales were down around 30%, sometimes 40%. Um, in the past 10 years before the pandemic hit, $8 billion has been moved from the brick and mortar um, bookstores to online sales. And that is dramatically dominated by Amazon. If you take Amazon's growth rate from like 2015 to 2019, it's about six to 8% of the market for new books every single year. If you extrapolate that to 2025, that's 80% of the market. So what happens then? Like what happens to all the authors, the whole ecosystem when Amazon's at 80% of the market? Um, I think it's a pretty dire situation. I don't want to seem like chicken little, but I think everybody in this call needs to really be aware that we are an inflection point. Amazon's putting the squeeze on libraries now. They're certainly putting the squeeze on bookstores. These are like the grassroots places where pe these are the places where people learn to love reading. And these are the places where communities gather around books. And without these grassroots places where people can encounter books and advocate for books and authors connect with their fans and book clubs gather and schools work with bookstores and libraries and all of that. Without that, like the, the presence of books in our culture, the importance of books in people's day-to-day -day lives will be diminished if the physical manifestations of our industry are wiped from the earth. And we need to reinforce that ecosystem really very passionately and actively. We can't afford to watch how things play out anymore. Um, you know, the first thing that people need to do is support their local indies, which is any author that has a local independent bookstore that they love, that they have a relationship with, that's where they should be putting their effort. That's where they should be selling signed editions, directing their fans to go to. Um, Bookshop is not meant to supplant that. That should be every author's number one priority. Um, and, but there also needs to be innovation because, you know, for the past 15 years, that's what 
the ABA has been saying, that's what everybody's been saying, shop at your local indie, don't shop at Amazon. That if that me message was sufficient, it's a necessary message, but it's not a sufficient message because if it was sufficient, we wouldn't need to do anything. But instead, we really do need to innovate right now. We need to undisrupt an industry that we love. We, need, we love bookstores. We love the tactile sensation of touching books, walking into those physical spaces, hunkering down, reading, talking to booksellers, that community, we need to preserve them. And the good news is that like the authors who are creating that content in some sense have all the power. Without authors, there is no publishing industry. There's no product. Um, authors can do a ton to advocate for the ecosystem, but they can't do it passively anymore. Um, they need to do it really, really actively and strongly and leverage the power of their audiences. Every author has an audience, whether it's a small audience or a big audience. And now is the time for them to leverage it because we don't want to get to a 2025 where Amazon is 80% of the market. And I, I mean, I, maybe, maybe that's like too gloom and doom and it wouldn't actually transpire. I can't be sure. And Michael probably knows better than I because he's got incredible insight and sees, cuts through all the fog um, when it comes to like what's actually going on in the industry. But I can tell you that like it, the pandemic has like put the pot on boil. If we were the frog in the pot that was getting warmer every year, the pan pandemic started the water boiling and we aren't gonna have much time to jump out of the pot. And that means also supporting not only indies and linking to bookshop when you don't have a specific indie and encouraging publishers and other places to support indies, support bookshop, um, but also supporting Barnes and Noble. We also really need Barnes and Noble to survive this and to come back strong. Um, so, and every author needs to be a voice telling people that and telling people that they need to support their physical spaces and support the ecosystem and keep a diverse, rich ecosystem. Because otherwise, like, what are you when, if Amazon has 80% of the book market, are, are you like, speaking of the freelancers bills, like you're a content creator for Amazon. Amazon is selling all the books. So we're all working for Amazon at that point. Um, and we can't, you know, obviously that's not gonna be healthy, even if you're an author that gets most of your revenue or a publishing house that gets most of your revenue from Amazon. And even if you think that they're a good partner, um, you can't expect a future where one player dominates the entire industry to be a positive future for the kind of culture that we love around books. And that's what we need to fight for now. I'll throw a plug in for Bookshop's affiliate program. Um, authors can become affiliates of Bookshop. It's a very generous affiliate program. It's meant to compete with Amazon's affiliate program. So for authors who have websites and social media and Instagrams and all of the rest of it, um, I might suggest that you take advantage of the Bookshop affiliate program and use their affiliate links or don't. Um, <laughs> but link to Bookshop or to your local bookstore. Okay, so uh, switching gears, you mentioned uh, Andy, the, I think you, you referenced obliquely the PRO Act, which is now coming down the line, which gives me an opportunity to move to Umer, who I, I know has, some, has something to share from the Authors Guild regarding this legislation that's now um, moving through Congress. Absolutely. And um, um, thanks, Andy. That was a very, very impassioned uh, call to arms. And um, in, in fact, uh, um, uh, so, so let me just preface it by saying that the Guild has been trying out different ways to get collective bargaining rights for authors for a number of years. Um, we have uh, uh, drafted uh, bills for antitrust exemption so that authors can uh, engage in concerted activity and 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 you know one um, uh, iteration of that concerted activity would be to um, you know have some control over uh, where their you know this is down the line but where their books might be sold. Uh, this is not related directly to the Pro Act, but just sort of to to put a put a concrete point on one what Andy was saying about 
the power of authors uh, individually, and then that, that that power is just magnified when when authors are able to sort of work together. Um, uh, so the the so we've been trying uh, for collective bargaining for a number of years, and and you know we were blessed with uh, uh, a Republican Senate for many of those years, so uh, we could not uh, really get anything off the ground. And then uh, now that we have a Democratic Senate, things are moving very fast. The House passed the Pro Act; they actually passed it last year too, and then it, it failed in the Senate, and now it's back up in the Senate again. Um, it does present an opportunity for a number of freelance journalists and writers, and there's, there's, there's some question about the degree to which um, book authors would be covered. Um, probably not, because the language of the book authors don't per se provide um, professional service, uh, but it, it's, it's definitely a, a space that the Guild is very interested in. Kind of uh, analyzing and exploring more, and 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 you know pushing for ways to uh, for book authors to also have the benefits of collective bargaining, but at least uh, as things stand right now, the Pro Act uh, would um, um, extend collective bargaining rights under the National Labor Relations Act uh, to uh, lots of freelance journalists and uh, writers, and that's because um, the Pro Act is um, is is uh, is is using. Um, um, the ABC test, which is you know quite controversial for for a number of different reasons, um, uh, to um, uh, uh, to deem independent contractors who meet the criteria of this test uh, employees only specifically for purposes of the National Labor Relations Act, and the the the, the very limited consequence of that is that those independent contractors will have the same rights under Section 7 of the NLRA as uh, employees, so the right to collective bargaining. And um, uh, there, there's also some prescriptions on, 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 on employers uh, as far as how they can stop, uh, how they can interfere with that collective bargaining activity. Um, and, and freelance uh, journalists and writers um, uh, fall under that because of the ABC test B prong, which um, um, so the ABC test requires that, uh, and it, in order to be, it's 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 kind of, it's kind of a, a confounding formulation because uh, it says unless, and then there are ABC three factors, and um, and and uh, and uh, an independent contractor that is truly an independent contractor in this scheme of the law uh, has to meet all three factors. And freelance writers and journalists would not meet B prong because they provide the professional services they provide are often, you know, when they when they work for a publication, they're providing services that is that is in the usual course or the primary course of the publications business. So uh, if, um, you know, in our in our blog, we we mentioned how if, um, um, uh, if, for instance, an independent contractor writer who um, writes uh, an article for the Authors Guild Bulletin wouldn't really be uh, uh, and wouldn't really be an employee into the Pro Act because the Authors Guild Bulletin is not a publication as such, you know. But if they were writing for you know any number of um, you know publications that we know and love, uh, they, they could conceivably have those rights under the Pro Act and would be able to sort of work with other writers to um, you know negotiate any number of things, you know, negotiate better terms. Um, they 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 could form a union. They don't have to. There's a choice. There's a bun. There's there's a lot of misconceptions uh, floating around about the pro act, and and I think the 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 principal one is that it uh, somehow nationalizes uh, California's AB five law, and so we've been trying very hard to sort of um, you know convey clearly that uh, the pro uh, the pro act only applies to collective bargaining rights. AB five and other state worker classification bills, uh, we had many problems with them because they applied to um, uh, employment, uh, worker classifications, benefits, taxes, and, and a number of other state law um, um, conditions that just the PRO Act has, does, doesn't have anything to do with. Um, and, and that's why when those state level bills were being debated and, and, and passed, we uh, worked very hard to get um, um, with other groups. Um, you, you know, there's a whole coalition of us worked very hard to get um, clearly defined exemptions for freelance journalists and writers. So precisely, so they would not be uh, classified as employees for those uh, state law um, purposes. And uh, you know, because we'd seen some of the consequences emerge in California, where freelancers lost uh, clients, and there was. Um, 
um, trepidation among um, publications from hiring California freelancers. Um, so I, that's that's sort of the uh, you know I mean I, I we, uh, this this could be a a, a pretty um, great development for a lot of freelance journalists and writers and we're um, you know we're continuing to work on it uh, and and um, you know make sure that um, uh, you know we can we can get that collective bargaining um, for authors and writers I mean you know, while working on book authors also. Thank you, Mayor. Mm-hmm. Um, as we've been switching over to this more, I guess, uh, legal conversation, there was a question that came up that um, I don't, maybe Michael would feel comfortable speaking to it. There's someone wondering if a, someone could explore an antitrust lawsuit uh, against Amazon. And there is, in fact, uh, some lawsuits out there uh, against Amazon. Um, Michael, could you explain what those are at the moment uh, and what, what they say? Uh, well, there aren't any current active lawsuits in the U.S. Um, what the, what there is is some renewed interest in regulatory or congressional oversight. So, in in the previous session of Congress, um, the House, in particular, a sub subcommittee of the Judiciary Committee, conducted a fairly extensive investigation. I'm sorry, I, I, I'm incorrect. Based on the House's investigation, there's been a there has been a class action lawsuit filed against. Amazon and ironically the big publishers who are their captive, who are being sued for being their captive. Um, it's a class action lawsuit, it's just begun. Uh, so we don't have any idea whether that's gonna bear any fruit. The basis of it is almost in toto evidence presented to the House Judiciary Committee. The, the, it's a long filing that essentially just footnotes extensively the House Judiciary Committee and its work. Um, so, which is meant to therefore be a basis to go do discovery um, and try to find evidence that would back up the accusations that are being made. Um, so it's filed, those things take a long time to go anywhere. Uh, I, think, I think there are greater expectations that, that regulatory oversight and investigations from DOJ and FTC and Congress may bring enough pressure on some of the big tech companies in general, of which Amazon is one, to, to bring some changes to bear. It parallels work that's been happening in the European Union for a couple of years now, um, both, both on the legal side as well as on the legislative side. There too, they, they move extremely slowly. Um, I will say the one thing we've seen with Amazon is, is when, regulatory pressure gets big enough, or as we saw a little bit in the case with ACX, when, when community pressure gets big enough and, and intrudes enough on day-to-day business, they do tend to respond. They, they have certainly in, in Europe, they made some changes to their most favored nations clauses and some of their other practices rather than see it brought to, to final action and adjudication before the European court. So. I would say the, the, the current better realistic expectation might be that if, if pressure is maintained, more evidence comes to bear, and more importantly, if Congress or DOJ actually shows signs of, of going beyond the talking about it before the camera stage and the we actually might do something stage, then, then there's an environment in which things might change voluntarily to, to preempt action, because action always takes long. To your point, Michael, there's indications that Amazon may make its own titles available to libraries through the Amazon publishing titles um, through a partnership with the DPLA, the Digital Public Library of America. And I see there are lots of articles. There was a Washington Post article just recently saying Amazon doesn't make books available to libraries and this must end. Um, But they're taking steps because I think they see the public dismay at that position. Correct. Although those we've had no update on those talks, which have been reportedly underway for a while, what accelerated that article is that that the other thing we're seeing is that state governments are now stepping in because the federal government has been unwilling or unable to act for so long, either because of lack of legislative will, lack of consensus on where to go, or just the fact that Congress can't do anything anymore. So. The, the library issue was raised again because a few states are, are 
in the middle of passing relatively non-specific acts sort of broadly requiring equal access for, for books and ebooks to libraries. Um, we don't know if those will have any teeth yet, but again, if you see enough states start to take action in place of the federal government, that too is the kind of thing historically that an Amazon would respond to, right? Because they have, by the same token, they now have distribution centers in pretty much every state and they have employees in many, many, many congressional districts. So that, you know, they're, they, they, they have two sides to this. They're powerful. <laughs> I, I just wanted to make a, um, a touch on uh, the because Michael gives such a great um, uh, uh, background on the antitrust issues and, and the, the House report that came out last year. Um, we we were it, we we did consult on, on um, that report with respect to conditions in the publishing industry and authors in particular. And um, one of the staffers who was uh, who was uh, work, who worked one of the principal authors of that report is uh, is. Uh, uh, I believe uh, I don't think she's been confirmed, but she's one. Of, she's a nominee for the FTC, com one of the FTC commissioner posts, Lena Khan. And um, so this is very much, uh, you know, just with respect. To there's there's so so many actions uh, and, and and so so much. Uh, um, uh, I guess uh, um, um, a momentum right now in 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 really kind of shaping um, or using antitrust law to really sort of. Uh, rein in some of these players but we we the guild is 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 very much also you know intends to to keep uh, authors a part of that conversation because authors were one of the first victims <laughs> you know of the of the tech tech industry and continue to be um um y y you know um I mean kind of goes also back to the um, nominal uh if if not non-existent bargaining power that authors have against these uh these these greater forces Thank you, Umair. So we've got about, uh, I don't know, maybe 15, 20 minutes left, if I'm not mistaken. I'd like to jump to um, diversity and equity initiatives in the industry. We've already touched on how summer 2020 um, saw Black Lives Matter related titles, anti-racism titles um, start selling in great quantities and there's continued interest. There are also a lot of scandals uh, that played out in 2020, American Dirt, uh, to name but one. And there have been lots of new hires. There have been new imprints focused on diversity and people of color, but there's still concern that some of this is performative um, or that everyone's gonna forget the priorities. Um, but we, by the same token, these initiatives take a long time to play out and require patience. Um, Aisha, I was wondering if we could start with you to talk about what you've been seeing, um, I know it's very early and there's, we can't expect the publishing industry to turn on a dime in addressing some really systemic issues here. And maybe you can just lay the foundation of where we've been at and, and what seems to be taking place right now. Um, yeah, absolutely. The, you know, change does take a long time, especially when it's, um, it, it's intended to, to happen industry wide. Um, having, having worked in publishing, you know, for 30 years, both on the editorial side and now as an agent, you know, I can say that there are, you know, very, very hopeful signs compared to what I've seen in the past in terms of hiring. Um, you know, starting at the, the very sort of like most, um, you know, junior levels of interns and um, then also assistants and even assistant editors, um, people in the junior uh, parts of across the, um, across the departments seem to be much, much more diverse. And that is very, very exciting. And then there, of course, been several high profile hires, you know, uh, starting with Lisa Lucas as the publisher of Pantheon, um, people like that, who are, you know, in uh, have decision making power and um, have the power to shape how not only the kinds of books that will be acquired, but how they will be published. And, and so that's that's really super thrilling. As far as everything else is concerned, it is really early days because, of course, you know, it's more than just hiring practices that need to be addressed. You know, it also is um, 
the ways in which they're um, while it is a very sort of close knit kind of cliquish network dependent industry, <laughs> um, it is um, it it's not necessarily one where uh, mentorship is institutionalized, and I I do think that that is a very important thing for the publishing industry to take a look at, because if you are from a marginalized community and you're entering what is still a relatively homogenous community, not only racially, but also um, in terms of class, particularly, you know, there's a certain kind of uh, um, upper middle, highly educated from very elite universities type of um, environment, then you, it's going to be difficult for you to navigate that if you don't come from that same background. And um, so I haven't necessarily seen yet, but I'm excited to see how publishers are going to be putting into place um, mentorship um, by you know, the more senior folks for you know, their, uh, their junior employees. Um, yeah. And Cheryl, would you like to jump in here with the Authors Guild side, uh, what initiatives you're undertaking? I would, Jane, thank you very much. As Mary pointed out during the annual meeting, uh, last June, the Authors Guild issued an anti-racism resolution. And at that time, we modified our mission to state then confirm that one of our goals is to broaden the breadth of the culture and the literary culture in this country and to better enhance the role of black authors in it who have been historically neglected over time. Uh, one of the things we did was found our, our diversity, equity and inclusion and accessibility committee, uh, which has been greatly helpful moving forward. And one of the big things we did last summer uh, with the uh, very able guidance of our North Carolina co-chairs, uh, Kelly Starling Lyons and Judy Allen Dotson was we conducted a three part series of panels called Black Voices Pushing for Change in Children's Book Publishing. These panels were followed by a program we called Office Hours, which was a series of small group chats between agents, editors, and other industry professionals and Black children's book writers and illustrators. We had such an enthusiastic and positive response to those first two that the third panel session was really entirely dedicated to just questions and answering the questions that we couldn't answer in terms of the other two panels. So what we're looking to is to move, make similar sorts of programs going forward. Uh, we're working on entering into partnerships with other organizations that represent writers of diverse and underserved backgrounds to see how the Authors Guild can present programs on the business of writing to their specific communities. We're working on an overall mentorship program here at the Guild, speaking of what Aisha was saying about the need for mentorship in the publishing industry. Uh, authors also need, a, need mentorship to figure out how to, negotiate, how to navigate these waters that so many emerging authors and authors of color just simply aren't familiar with. So we're working on that, creating that uh, mentorship program guildwide. And we're also, uh, following in the shoes of the hashtag publishing paid me uh, movement last year on Twitter, uh, we're trying to develop an, an, anima, an anonymous survey of author advances, uh, which we would do a survey that would state not, in which authors would state not only the, the amount they received, but also provide key data such as their race, their gender, their genre. So we can try to see, you see it, make a comparison to see if race and maybe gender and other factors are correlating with, act, with authors receiving not only lower advances, but lesser marketing efforts and efforts to publicize their books. So those are some of the things that the Guild is working on to broaden, uh, the, broaden the diversity, equity, and inclusion in the industry. I'm really looking forward to the results of that advance survey. <laughs> Stay tuned for that. Um, I'm turning my attention to some of the questions that are coming through. And, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Carolyn is wondering where are we at with the increasing consolidation of major publishing houses, which bring up, brings up an issue that um, I had hoped we'd have time for, which is, of course, the Penguin Random House. Uh, Simon & Schuster merger. Um, so for those who might not be aware, Simon & Schuster was put up for sale by its corporate parent, Viacom CBS. Uh, Penguin Random House, which is the biggest U.S. publisher, won the bid. Um, and so there, there are some who think this is very, very bad. Um, there are some who are 
kind of like, eh, what did you expect? Um, and I wonder if anyone would like to start us off on what this might mean, if it, how, um, how bad is it? Um, who, who wants to raise their hand? Umer, maybe you can, um, <laughs> I'm going to pick on you. <laughs> I'm sure Michael also has uh, you know thoughts on that. Um, I you know I, it's 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 uh, it's 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 not it's you know it's not terrible like you you know it's it's somewhere somewhere in between because uh, and and we did um, um, uh, sign on to a letter um, early on um, um, discussing the implications of the merger um, and and we w w what we are we. In the letter, we sort of raised two issues. You know, I think I think the trend of consolidation in the publishing industry as a whole is uh, is certainly worrying in terms of the the the, the choices it can limit for authors, um, and um, um, you know also how it might impact the kinds of books that are acquired by publishing houses. Um, and but you know, I mean, the the the, the consolidation also has a reason. You know, the elephant in the room <laughs> that we've actually. Um, uh, explored pretty thoroughly in this uh, <laughs> in, in in this conversation now, which is Amazon. Um, but but in terms of the specific uh, um, um, uh, the, the specific merger of Penguin Random House and Simon and Schuster, I mean, uh, uh, working on the author side at the Guild, we um, often look at Simon at, at Penguin Random House as sort of um, an industry leader among the publishers in terms of best practices. Um, uh, they, they, and, and, you know, we've had conversations with them and they've been saying the, 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 saying the right things in terms of allowing their imprints to have independence, uh, which, you know, goes to the question, goes to the, the, the question of having, um, you know, editors being able to acquire the books uh, independent of any sort of hierarchical company-wide decision-making process. Um, and uh, the other the thing that, that sort of distinguishes them from other industry consolidations is that they allow their imprints to uh, bid against um, each other and if they really want to acquire those um, you know those those books so so in a way you know we we do think that if 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 a if a publisher as you know story as Simon and Schuster is is, uh, is on the block uh, um, uh, you know Penguin Random House is, is about is, is is about as good of a steward uh, that we can find um, and but but yeah I think overall um, consolidation does raise some some important concerns for authors. Michael, did you, did you have anything or Aisha maybe? Um, I have lots of things. I don't know if I can say <laughs> it because because I'm reporting on this actively, right? So and and we're trying to. Our mission is to keep people informed, yeah. uh, not not to take a position here. Uh, the whether or not the deal gets approved is is a black box, right? The the regulators do their investigations and then they tell you when they're finished, and you don't get any indications along the way. So. In some respects, none of us have a vote on whether this is good or bad. I mean, if you believe it is bad, you can bring public pressure to bear. And, and sometimes both the government as well as the deal participants are responsive to public pressure. So, so that is certainly an outlet. Um, if you believe it's bad, you can, or you can speak to your representatives. They, they too can have influence or you can connect to the Authors Guild or, or other organizations that might represent you and be able to amplify your voice. Um, what I will say, th th there's, there's a ten, no, there, you, you can almost never find somebody in any industry who says consolidation is great. I want more of it, right? I mean, by, by our nature, we tend to like industries that have diversity. Um, although monopolies are efficient, right? And, and they, they can provide consumer benefits. Um, I, I think almost any industry, people like to see multiple strong players. So I would say one of the good things to hold on to, regardless of whether the deal is approved or not, is all businesses need investment to grow and, and thrive, right? And for a long time, we've been conditioned to believe that books and publishing is, is a low growth, no growth, stable, but not particularly attractive industry, right? And the, co the financial commitment that Bertelsmann is prepared to make here and the multiple that they are prepared to pay, which is a far greater multiple than we've ever seen before, 
is for anybody who cares about this industry, a sign to any and all that this is a business that people believe is worth investing in. And for everyone who thinks it, it is entirely an Amazon driven business and no one else can survive in it, um, this, this is a strong statement backed up by actual purse strings to the contrary. Uh, so, so although very few people will come out and say, yay, consolidation, they, they will say, yay, investment, right? And, and so the fact that there were multiple bidders of scale is encouraging. You know, back in 2012, 2013, when Penguin and Random House merged, which at the time was the largest trade publishing merger ever, the amount of investment that traded hands was zero dollars. That, that was a, that was a, it was a clever deal but nobody was putting money on the table saying, we are gonna invest right now in a much larger publisher. Money changed hands later, once, once, the, once the consolidation, once the merger integration had, was underway and the company started growing again, and then Bertelsmann saw that, that they could invest further. So this is sort of night and day in that respect, right? Um, this, this is a serious financial investment. And again, Bertelsmann, which owns Penguin Random House as a company, has a long history here, right? This publishing is, is core to that company's existence. So also this is, this is not an enterprise that's gonna change their minds about their commitment to books and literature anytime soon, as far as we know it. So their argument too is, if consolidation is going to happen, if assets like this are going to get bought up and put into one place, do you want them in the hands of a gigantic entertainment conglomerate or a tech giant? Right. Or do you want them in the hands of a corporation that has a commitment to the industry? Right, right, absolutely. And, and just to sort of go back to that, um, M Michael made a really good point. Uh, we, we initially, uh, when we Post the merger, we were concerned um, that what happens if uh, you know management changes again. Right now, you know we are sort of um, um, uh, we can be comforted by the fact that Bertelsmann does value the in industry so much. Uh, but uh, you know, there's still this question of well, what happens if if the if, if the management changes? How will that um, affect uh, diversity in terms of acquisitions and uh, how, how, you know, whether or not it will shrink the number of people, ultimately the number of people that are making decisions in terms of the lists um, and, and make the, the, the publishing house more hierarchical. So um, those, are, those are all sort of open questions that, that we'll, we'll, we'll keep, um, you know, looking at. Andy, I wonder if I could put you on the spot with this issue because you know, there's some concern that greater consolidation means there's a less diverse publishing industry or there are fewer risks being taken once you get to a Penguin Random House size. Maybe they're more conservative in the sorts of choices that they're making. Some have expressed this as an opportunity for literary independent publishers, smaller pu publishers to come in and maybe take the books that a really large consolidated company might not do. What do you think about that? I think it's absolutely true. And it's one of the great things about independent publishing. Although certainly within Penguin Random House, there are a lot of imprints, many of whom are looking to take risks, especially right now. You brought up Lisa Lucas. I'm sure that Lu Lisa Lucas is not operating on that principle right now. Um, but look at the success that Grove Atlantic has. Like they're winning the Booker Prize multiple times. They're winning National Book Awards. They publish incredible work. You know, Grey Wolf Press. Um, there's just really great, unique work being published by independents all over the country. I mean, I, my imprints are Catapult, Counterpoint, and Soft Skull Press, and we definitely try to take risks that other publishers weren't because it won't, because that's our advantage and that's where you can shine and that's where you can like seeing the value in something that others might overlook is, that's the prospecting that every independent does, but it's also, that it's really essential to the greater literary conversation and, and what makes the literary world so dynamic. And, and I think that that's, it even includes um, self-published authors and everybody else. Like the fact that, that things are so democratic now that people can publish online, they can publish eBooks, they can build platforms without any kind of 
big financial backing has, is a great development and I'm all for it. And so, um, you know, I think that of course, big publishers have enormous leverage. And that's one of the issues that I have with Amazon. I've got, of course, a lot of issues with Amazon, but one of the issues I have is that like there's that um, best sellers are best sellers because they're best sellers. That happens on Amazon. You get them that, that Amazon bestseller list, you're surfaced first in their search. They put you in their promotions, it reinforces it. It keeps the same 10 books, same 20 books in circulation over and over again all year. That's where the money is. That's where PRH is gonna be focused. It's just the, the way things are. And I think it's getting harder and harder, especially in certain um, avenues like thrillers and like it's really hard for new writers to break into those markets because of the consolidation. Like once if everybody's buying from Amazon, especially in eBooks, um, then, and they just reinforce the same patterns by having these blockbusters and this top 10 lists, it's really, really difficult for new writers to break in. So at the same time, you've got this incredible democratization that technology allows. You also have the kind of capital, capitalist structures that are being built around the commerce side that are fundamentally undemocratic. And it's up to like disruptors and innovators and people who are passionate about these things to try to try to work around that and find ways to, to make it more diverse again and to empower creators and small presses and everybody else to get their message out and to build audiences as well. Well, I think you just gave us our marching orders uh, for uh, as authors and editors and publishers. Um, that brings us to 815, which I believe we're supposed to be closing up shop here. Um, who should I hand things over to now? Cheryl or? Uh, I can certainly close out. I don't know if Jen, uh, our IT person is on, but, and there she is. I am. That is the close of the meeting and the panel. So we thank everyone for joining us. Um, if we were unable to get to your questions, again, we will look those over and try to, to get answers to everyone who reached out to us. So thank you to all of our panelists. Thank you to all of our members. And um, good night. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night. <laughs>